folks and welcome again to all of you who have been here before and this back on the Religion Conference first time. This is the second set of these public lectures on creation. Last week, to my view anyway, was very successful. We had many folks in, we had many folks interested, and I hope I can interest you again this evening as we commence the second set of lectures on creation. And I'm homing in tonight on a big question like, how are we here? And why? Now, I don't mean how are we here at all, but at all, because, well, let me start there. How are we here? Because there's no difference in the between how and why. How are we here? Well, we either walked or were dropped off at the door, or we had transport of some kind, and here we are. And that's good. But why are we here? Well, I think you've come to listen to me, but I hope it goes beyond that, and you've come to learn more than be challenged by both what science says and what the Bible says about this great world we live in and this great universe that the world belongs to. So tonight we want to have a look at this and in fact weigh up the factors that are involved in why we are here and how we are here because really the universe we live in is a very hostile place. And what we can learn about it from observations taken from Earth and from the space stations, the universe is a very, very hostile place for life. And yet, this world that we live in is teeming with life of all sizes, of all shapes, of all varieties. And if it was left to a lottery of some kind, there would be very, very little chance of life existing in the universe. And yet, the amazing thing is that life exists right here on Earth. So let's think a bit about the factors that are involved in all this. And let me try, let me try to talk you through them. Here's an impression of the universe, this huge, almost boundless space, which is either freezing cold or roasting hot. And our planet is one of those there that surrounds the sun. And our planet, Earth, is the only one on which life exists. And what I want to show you tonight, Earth, the planet Earth, is the only planet that's just right for life to exist. And that in itself is quite a mystery if you read God out. Let me tell you a story. A story that many of you will know from long ago. Most of you are too old to remember this story, so let me run you through it quickly. There was a naughty little girl called Goldilocks. She was so called because she had beautiful golden hair. One day she was wandering in the woods and came across a little house which belonged to three bears. And into this house she would venture. And the naughty little girl that she was began to make herself at home. And first of all, she tried the chairs. And she found that some were too hard and some were too soft, but one was just right. Then she thought she'd try the beds. One of the beds was too big and one was too small, and the other was just right. Then, of course, she tried the porridge. And lo and behold, although one of the porridge was too hot and the other was too cold, one of the bowls of porridge was just right. And Paul Davies, who wrote this very interesting book some years ago, used that analogy to pose the question, why is the universe just right for life? And in particular, the planet Earth that we live on, this unique part of the universe is just right for life. Now, Paul Davies is not a Christian believer. I'm not sure if he has any religious feelings at all. But from his science, he posed this question and tried to answer it, and tried to give pointers to why this universe is just right for life. And the conclusion really has to be, was it by design, or was it by accident? Let's leave the universe aside and just think about the solar system to which we belong. And there's a fairly detailed poster with some graphics about the different planets and what features they have. This represents the Sun, and then we've Mercury, Venus, Earth, and then Mars, and Jupiter, and Saturn, and right out. And if you have time, you can read all these tabloids, which will give some interesting details of all of these. But of them all, Earth is the only one that is at all suitable for life. And let's explore why. Let's just look at the mock-up of the Earth and the solar system. And there we have the Sun, at approximately five and a half thousand degrees centigrade on its surface, 
Although the temperature in the interior of the sun is a lot many higher than that. So we get energy from the sun, and there we are, lower left hand corner is F with perhaps a medium temperature of 20 degrees C. And we are 93 million miles, give or take a wee bit, from the sun, which is just right for those temperatures to balance. The five and a half thousand degrees centigrade sun, the 20 degrees centigrade earth, balance because of that distance, 93 million miles. If we were closer than that, the sun would be, earth would be too hot. If we were further away, the earth would be too cold. But as it is, death is just right for life at that temperature. Let's just look at one or two other things around this. Um, the size of the sun is about 109 times bigger than Earth. Earth has one satellite called the Moon, which is a quarter of a million miles away from us most of the time, and it's a quarter of the mass of Earth. The two nearer planets are Venus and Mercury, and they're both smaller than Earth, but look at their temperatures. Venus has a temperature of about 475 degrees C, and Mercury, although it's nearer the Sun, swings in temperature from plus 400 to minus 170 degrees C. The reason for that I don't want to go into, all I'm doing is showing you that those planets, although they're near, near, near neighbours to Earth, no chance of supporting life. Yet here we are, happily tonight, at least I think happily tonight, on planet Earth, and the conditions for, Earth, for life on Earth are just right, principally because of that 93 million mile distance between Earth and the Sun. If you're interested in the maths, there it is. The force that holds the planets in their orbit around the Sun is called the gravitational force, and you guys that are good at maths all know that equation at the bottom anyway, but we won't go into it for now. What we'll do rather is think once more about life. We'll start at the other end and say, yes, life exists, and we know that life needs certain things. Last week I was at pains to point out to you, as you know, that life cannot come from dead matter. The law of biogenesis says life can only come from previous life, and so if there's life on Earth, it needed a start. And I was showing you last week, I hope you were convinced, that life had to come from a previous life giver, and in my view, that life giver is Almighty God. However, once life is here, once life is started, it's fragile and it needs certain things. Let's look at them. It needs water. Those people who spend millions and millions of pounds or dollars in exploring space are always on the lookout for water because they say if we find water on some planet or some star, that probably means there's life there. Doesn't necessarily mean there's life there, but it does show us that if there is no water, there will be no life. Life needs water. Life also needs a given temperature. <coughs> too hot, it will fry. Too cold, it will freeze. The temperature range needs to be just right. Life also needs food, or at least an energy source of some kind, which we can colloquially call food. And also, life needs protection. Given that conditions in the universe can swing between such extremes, and given that radiation comes from the sun and other celestial bodies towards the earth where life is, there needs to be a protective mechanism, otherwise life would be, uh, cut, would be uh, cut out. So on planet Earth, we've got plenty of water. In fact, 71% of the Earth's surface is water. And in spite of all the probes that go to the other planets, hardly any of them has discovered real evidence of water. People are desperate to find it, and if they suspect it's there, they'll have a look. But then they'll find the solar system, only Earth is bountifully supplied with water. In fact, there's an interesting verse in the Bible that says all the rivers run into the sea, and yet the sea is not full. And you know why, in fact, the verse in the Bible goes on to tell you that to the place from which the water comes, there it goes back. You have the endless cycle, the water cycle, they call it. 
water falling from the earth's surface in the form of rain, the lakes and channels and rivers and so on runs into the sea and then so much evaporation sends it back up again and the cycle is endless. It's a wonderful cycle. It's the best water purification system there is and thanks to that we're all alive tonight. But the point I'm making is quite simple. Earth is bountifully supplied with water and that's one absolute essential for life. For life. <coughs> as well as that, I was saying to you a minute ago that it needs protection. And round Earth there is an atmosphere, a critical atmosphere at that, which serves a number of functions, some obvious, some less obvious. But it is there to shield us and protect us. I'll be mentioning later on the kinds of radiation that come from outer space towards the Earth, which in fact is hostile to life. But because of the influence of the atmosphere, Earth is shielded and protected from many things that would disrupt life. It's also there to insulate planet Earth. Many of you have greenhouses in which you try to keep a temperature higher than norm. And if it was not for the Earth's atmosphere, then the solar heating of the day would quickly disappear and the nights would freeze. The atmosphere insulates Earth's surface, keeps the temperature steady. It's there, as I pointed out already, to recycle water. It's also there <coughs> to provide oxygen and gaseous form in the correct amount that we need to breathe and other animals as well. If that oxygen content was significantly higher, you wouldn't be able to contain fire. Fire would get out of control. If the oxygen con content was significantly lower, we and animals abroad on the Earth's surface would not be able to survive by breathing. Our lungs would need to be twice as fast as they are to enable them to survive on an atmosphere which did not have that kind of amount of oxygen in them. So it seems to me and seems to a lot of people that this atmosphere around us, around the <coughs> Earth itself, is quite an interesting and quite an important and quite a fascinating thing. It's balanced just right for life. Now what about temperature? Neither too hot, nor too cold. And for life that kind of means between nothing and 45 degrees C, and for the likes of us, the best temperature, the temperature of our bodies is give or take a little bit, 37 degrees C. So the temperature on Earth is just right to support life. From the sun there comes light energy. On this beautiful early summer's evening, the sun's hardly set, and we benefit from the lengthening hours of daylight and the heat that there is in the sun. But as well as light and heat that we are well aware of, there are other forms of radiation that come from the sun and from other celestial bodies a little bit further away. The whole spectrum of radiation is huge. The radiation range is measured by the wavelength of the light. And you can have waves as short as one billionth of a meter to those that are as long as 1,000 meters throughout the universe. We are aware of some of those because the shortwave radiation is made use of in X-rays and eventually in ultraviolet. The longwave radiation is made use of in TV and radio transmission and you know about microwaves. And then we come to the infrared. And in this narrow region in the middle, between the ultraviolet and the infrared is the visible region that we all appreciate, where in fact we have the rainbow colours in the region that you can see after a shower of rain. We thrive on this middle section. We need it. We need the heat in the infrared area. We can be seriously damaged by ultraviolet. Many of us who are getting older, who are getting old, and didn't know in previous years that it was bad to sunbathe and you worked without sunscreen and a hat on, are finding that our skin is beginning to show damage and incipient cancer growths because ultraviolet light damages cancer. Don't clean the air, call the virus. 
I'll tell you what, when damage your skin and causes cancer. And more than that, deep ultraviolet, beyond the range that we normally feel from the sun, the deep ultraviolet can actually destroy cells. It can be totally toxic to certain organisms, which in fact is made use of in some areas in sterilization. You can sterilize certain oceans by shining ultraviolet light on them. So here we are living in a world at the right temperature, a world that receives radiation from the sun and elsewhere. Some of that radiation is what we need that's in the middle, but other bits can be seriously damaging. So we have an atmosphere that filters out some of the damaging radiation. We also have water which as well as being the ideal medium for life, water also absorbs harmful radiation. Water to our eyes is clear, it's transparent, but water absorbs ultraviolet. And if it didn't, that ultraviolet would reach us in far bigger quantities than it does. So there's another good idea to have plenty of water on the planet. It absorbs the harmful radiation. It also dissolves many substances. As we'll see shortly, we need not only water, but water more material <coughs> that people enjoy. And water is probably the ideal solvent for many substances, both inorganic and organic ones. In addition, another property of water, which is extremely beneficial, is that it effectively absorbs heat. It has what is, what is uh, scientifically called a high heat capacity, which really means if you're trying to store heat, one of the best places to store it in is water. As, com as compared, say, to a lump of steel. Steel will absorb heat, it will not store it. Water absorbs heat and keeps it. It has a high heat capacity. It also has a high ability to transfer heat by vaporization. Water, when it evaporates, releases heat. When it condenses, it absorbs heat. <coughs> and that, in the life processes that we all depend on in our breathing and such like, is a great benefit. Our bodies are made up of huge amounts of water, and that's one of the reasons. <coughs> also, Water allows transport of materials through very thin capillaries because water has a low viscosity. Compare water to oil or shekel, which is a better example, and you know how easily water will flow. And its low viscosity enables it to penetrate very, very tiny capillaries, which permeate all our bodies. You can see the blood vessels on the back of your hand. But from each of these blood vessels, each of these veins, there's a network of finer and finer capillaries until they kind of become so fine you can't see them. And there are miles and miles of these throughout our bodies, connecting up to all our body organs and cells, transporting nutrients in and taking waste materials away. And water is the ideal medium for this transport process. One other thing about water which is extremely interesting is that its solid form, we call it ice, is less dense than its liquid form, which is almost unique in every substance in nature. There is hardly one other substance in nature which does not sink after it becomes solid. But you know well that for as well as being solid, it's a bit of an insulator, it keeps the heat up from away from what's underneath it. And you know well from experience that ice floats on water. And that's an amazingly important thing for life. You think about aquatic life. And if ice sank to the bottom, then let me put it this way, the poor little fishes in the bottom would be displaced upward. And if the insulating properties of ice were away down at the bottom, more and more ice would form on the top because cooling comes from the atmosphere. So eventually, <coughs> ponds and bodies of water would freeze from the bottom up, would displace the life that's in the water, 
And of course, Paul is going to eventually tell it because it's who we treat. So, of all the substances that are known to man, all the substances that are known to science, water is unique. Water is important. Water is, and I use the word, designed to support life. It floats on water. Everybody knows that. And I think everybody also knows that water is made from two hydrogen atoms and one oxygen atom joined to one another, but not in a straight line. It's V-shaped in the Z. And if it was not V-shaped, if it was not bent like that, then water would have entirely different properties. It would not make a structure like ice, which can float. It would be what one might call a more normal type of substance. If you then go a bit further than that, you say, well, but why is a water molecule this shape? <coughs> no, okay, go to somebody who knows chemistry and they'll tell you some ideas, but if you keep on asking questions, eventually you run out of answers. Because the whole universe is designed around the particles that make up the atoms. And these particles are what they are because they've been designed that way. Mostly because God made them that way. So water, the ideal substance for supporting life. So, let's recap. For life on Earth, water exists in a liquid form. Essential radiation is present, that's to say the light from the sun, the light that we get shooting through the windows, this is present. While the harmful radiation, the heat ultraviolet, is kept out, filtered out, in the clouds, in the atmosphere, and in the water itself. <coughs> as well as that, on Earth, the necessary major elements that make up life forms are present and readily available. The most important one of these is carbon, probably followed by oxygen, <coughs> but nitrogen and hydrogen are also necessary. In addition to these major elements, some minor ones are necessary, like iron, and copper, and calcium, and magnesium. We're not just made of pure water, we're made of a solution of things, and these minor elements are equally essential to support life. And I'm coming now to talk for a few minutes about carbon compounds, because life on Earth is based on carbon. Those of us in this room have got lots of water about us, but we've also got lots of carbon. Carbon, as you know, exists in many, many forms. You can get charcoal, you can get graphite, you can get diamond, you can get impure forms of carbon. You can even get graphene, a new extremely strong material made just of carbon. But the big thing about carbon compounds is there's a huge variety of them, a really huge variety of them. The substances can be quite simple, that means the molecules can be quite small. I've mentioned already carbon dioxide, one carbon, two oxygens joined together, and this time the oxygen, the carbon, and the oxygen are in a straight line. Another marvel of chemistry. Or you can get a little bit bigger molecules, and one everybody knows about, I guess, is glucose. which, if you remember your school chemistry, has got six carbons, 12 hydrogens, and six oxygens. And there are many, many carbon-containing compounds with that kind of number of atoms in them. But you and me sitting here tonight have in our bloodstream a very, very important substance called hemoglobin. I don't know how they did it, but somebody counted that in hemoglobin, there's 2,952 carbon atoms. There are 4,664 hydrogens, 832 oxygens, 812 nitrogens, 8 sulfurs, and 4 irons. An amazing chemical substance, amazing structure, amazing function. And it's the iron, although there's only 4 atoms among these thousands of thousands of others, it's the iron that does the trick. 
that absorb the oxygen, that releases oxygen. So, so when you breathe in, your lungs, as we see the global anomaly of where they receive the oxygen, they transfer it to a distant cell. You're doing the best just now, and then we'll need to keep, keep talking. And then the waste products, mostly carbon dioxide, after the oxidation has taken place and energy has been released, the carbon dioxide is transported back to the lungs where it breathes out. And it all depends on these four iron atoms doing their job of hemoglobin to keep on transporting oxygen and keeping us alive. Those of you, I don't know if you fear, but those of you who know people who do have iron deficiency will know how serious a problem that is in terms of energy levels. So, carbon compounds. Huge variety, small ones, simple ones, huge ones, complex ones, and the story goes on. The carbon compounds can be of the type that they will avoid water and grant a waterproof kind of effect, like on our skin. I won't demonstrate it, but if I pour this water on my skin, you know we just found it. But on the other hand, there are parts of me that absorb the water that need to, because certain carbon compounds are waterproof. Other carbon compounds go right into water and dissolve in it, like the sugars that many of you like. Huge variety of size, huge, huge variety of function, huge variety of type. More than that, especially these big carbon molecules are very, very specific shapes. And because of that, very specific functions. And I'll show you one or two of these later. One example is that even though, for example, an amino acid has the same chemical structure, sorry, has the same chemical formula, and if you drew it out on a flat piece of paper, there's only one way you could draw it, but once you put it in, into three dimensions, you get two different types. They're called D and L, for doing the jargon. But it just means one is like your right hand, one is like your left hand, and your right hand and left hand are rubber images of one another, but they're not superimposable. And that gives you two types of molecules from the same structure. And the amazing thing is that in nature, especially in proteins, although there's the possibility of these D and L ones, only one form is used and useful. Something very specific happens in these carbon-containing substances. <coughs> and last but no means least, the carbon compounds of which our bodies are made need to change. And they need to change by whatever action can generate the change. And that action could be light, or that action could be an enzyme, a special catalyst that's inside to make things change. Now, if they were more inert, the change wouldn't happen easily. If they were less inert, more reactive, it would happen too fast and would burn up. The carbon compounds are of such a structure and type <coughs> that the reactivity is just right for the temperature at which we live and the structure of which our bodies are made. Here's a wee caricature of life in a solution. We finish up with something like that. I don't think it's a true representation of lecture. But up here are some of the things that make up our body. There is in this jar some inorganic substances, we call them ions. Many of you will recognize these. There's in this jar a number of organic things like fatty acids, glycerol to make it fats. There's glucose, amino acids, and proteins, something else that our bodies require, and there's a few other odds and ends. And if they're all poured together somehow and chemistry does its tricks, at the other end there comes a living human being, or at least that's what they think. So you start off with these components, and you finish up with a living person. The big question is how on earth does that happen? How does chemistry manage to do that? Well, actually, chemistry can't do that on its own. There's more to it than that. So let's see what else there is to it than that. By doing, hope you don't get bored at this bit, doing a tiny bit of 
and a string. Now, if I was in my professional role, I would work eloquently on this story, but I won't for somebody else who's equally as eloquent in the audience, and we drive for each other's attention. So let's do some simple chemistry. Chemistry, you all know. The top one is what happens in your gas boiler. There's methane gas burning in oxygen, produces carbon dioxide and pollutes the atmosphere, produces energy, uh, water usually in the form of steam, but the big thing you want to produce energy. You can do the same kind of thing with glucose, that molecule I showed you a while ago with six carbons in it. You can burn that in oxygen and it will produce the same product and release energy. That will happen in a furnace in your boiler at around about 500 degrees C when, you know, the boiler fires up and you get spontaneous release of all the energy that's in these molecules. No problem with that, the blood to benefit from it on a cold winter's day. But we don't work at 500 degrees C, we work at around about 37 degrees C. How can we get energy release from the like of glucose in water, not in fire, but in water at that temperature? And the energy is not released all at once, it's released slowly and in a controlled fashion. The secret is, this is done by the help, with the help of enzyme catalysts, living catalysts, organic substances that actually catalyze the process at that temperature. And these enzymes, these catalysts, are themselves complex protein molecules. So here's another problem for chemistry. How does chemistry convert these smaller molecules like amino acids, sugars, carbon dioxide, water. How does chemistry manage to do this inside our body? Because these complex protein molecules are really the stuff of life. They make up muscle, they make up blood vessels, they make up almost everything inside of us. So how can chemistry do all that? It does it in what we might call a cell factory. I mentioned in one of my lectures last week that one of the key things about all life forms is that we are made up of tiny cells. Cells so small you can't see them, so many of them you couldn't count them, but they're there. And the key thing about life is that they have these self-replicating cells, which themselves are a marvel, but they are the place where everything happens. They are a factory in which this chemistry takes place. And here's one or two facts. To produce one protein in a cell requires more than 75 different proteins and molecules, special molecules called RNA, which we need to worry about the meaning of. And an average protein is produced in simple cells every four minutes. So we've been here about 28 minutes. Think of the number of protein molecules that have been produced in your cells during the week while you've been sitting here. But more than that, these, this process can only happen in the cell, provided the cell contains all 75 components that are necessary in the right place at the right concentration, and in the right proportions, and at the right time. Now for that to happen, or for something like that to happen, in a chemical works, in a biological production line, needs a huge amount of organisation, and a huge amount of energy, and a huge efficiency. But it happens within every living cell of our bodies. <coughs> Every day we live, 24 7, this process goes on, enabling us to keep living. I think it said in that last slide that the cell was simple, in a simple cell, I said, because that representation, just a graphic, represents one of the more simple types of cells in our bodies. Our body has many different types of cells. But in case you get it wrong, even the simplest of cells, even the simplest of cells is not simple. Here's an analogy. A 
an airliner like that one consists of around about four and a half million non-flying parts. And when they're all put together, they then fly. A cell contains billions, note this, billions of non-living parts, each of which on their own would not be living, but all put together make up the cell which is living. It's not a simple thing. It is an extremely complex thing and an extremely efficient thing to enable life process to continue, to enable the cell itself to make another copy of itself and make an organism grow and survive. This is amazing. Now, let's go out in the chemistry lab to the big universe. Life needs, we've gone through it, water, specific temperature, proper things to work on, to work with, and the whole system disintegrated and controlled. But behind the chemistry, and behind the physics, and behind the working of the universe, whether it's the planets or the distant galaxies, there are certain basic constants, physicists call them. Constants like the speed of light, the gravitational constant, that by the way was the big G on my mock-up with the green background of the solar system. Planck's constant, which has to do with the transfer of energy in the inside of atoms. And there's also the very short-range forces inside the nucleus of an atom. All of these constants are basic constants for the working of the universe, and they have very precise values. Say someone who knows, because I can't analyze this lot, if some of these constants were just a fraction of a percent different, then the whole physical nature of the universe would be radically different. And if that was the case, we wouldn't have water the way it is, we wouldn't have temperature the way we are, life would not exist anywhere. These constants are just the right value for life to appear in the universe somewhere, and that somewhere is planet Earth. These constants make the universe what it is, suitable for life. And the big question is, but why do they have these precise values and no others if you vary them by a fraction of a percent? The whole thing goes awry. Why do they have these precise values? Well, there's been a puzzle for a number of scientists, and some of them have commented on it. Some of them say, yeah, that's right, but we don't know why, can't give you an answer. Somebody says, this is interesting, perhaps the universe really is designed for life. And if so, if so, life assembles itself slowly and at random, but in some sense, inevitably. And then someone else said, if there is a God, and if he had a hand in it, then he acts as it is then. These are some of the comments people have made. Most folk have heard of this gentleman who died while he ago, Albert Einstein, one of the greatest scientists of all time, with the greatest brains, and his quotes were for get, worth uh, noting. He said, the most incomprehensible thing about the universe is that it is comprehensible. Now you think about that. What I think he's saying is, Although the universe is so complex, so large, so deep, so unfathomable, there is a wonder that's bigger than that, and the wonder is that there are people like us who can actually begin to investigate it and understand it. Put another way, he said, the biggest mystery about astronomy is the astronomer. And the fact that you and I here tonight can begin to think about the universe, we can't go there and visit it all, we can simply read and learn about what other people have discovered and have a look at some of the deductions they've made. And remember, science is building up theories from observations through hypotheses and so on. And the facts are there, it just all would mean that the conclusions are absolutely right. But we can think about them, we can ponder them. 
And the fact that there are beings like us on earth who have the ability to think about the universe and try to solve its mystery is itself both the most mysterious thing and the most amazing thing. So much then for these quotes. Let's look at some others. Some more comments. Clyde Hoyle, a British astronomer, says, This enigmatic display of cosmic fine-tuning suggests that the universe looks like a hooked-up job. Think about that one. Enigmatic, uh, by the way, forgive me, that's where I stole one of my words from this week's lectures. I suggested this week's lectures were about how are we here, the great enigma of our existence. Here's this enigma of fine tuning, <coughs> constant spot on. If they weren't, the whole thing would be different. It looks like, you know what a foot up job is? Yes, you do. Looks like somebody would hunt it. Or here's another one Freeman Dyson, a physicist. It seems, says he, if in some sense the universe knew we were coming. Now, as far as I'm aware, both these gentlemen are not religious, certainly not Christian believers, but from their science, from the study of astronomy and study of physics, these men have thought out that because the universe is what it is, it's pointing towards life arriving. Cosmologists, those who are involved in this, call it the anthropic principle. In other words, that the universe in all its huge scale and all its intricacy is pointing towards man. That's what cosmologists call it. But those of us who are indeed very privileged to call themselves Christians <coughs> say, you've not quite got it right. We say it was God. The hand of God made it that way. <coughs> Whether it's the galaxies, the precise value of the constants, the conditions on earth to support life, God did it. And if you take the time to go home maybe tonight or another night and read the first page in your Bible, you will find that's exactly what it's telling you. Now the details may be different, but what it's doing is saying the universe was empty. And God filled it. And God put there a special planet called Earth, and it was bare, it was formless, it was useless as it was, but step by step, God put things there until it was ready for man to arrive, and then God put man there. And from there, everything has kept going. The hand of God is there, and physics is pointing to it, astronomy is pointing to it, chemistry is pointing to it, science points to God. And those of us who are scientists and Christians marvel at the wonder of what God has done. We marvel at the wonder of what God has done in other ways, but in studying nature, in these precise things, in these complex things, we just love and worship God. With me we finish, I must draw your attention to this book. His name hasn't appeared so far, Michael Benton. This is one of the most interesting books I've read in the past 20 years. Again, this man, as far as I can work out, is not a religious man, he's certainly not a Christian believer. But he's one of those who goes on record as saying that the theory of evolution is not correct. And he's taken it further and said that the laws of biology reveal purpose in the universe. He calls it nature's destiny. If you look at nature, what's the destiny? What's it all pointing to? <coughs> now let me just give you one or two quotes out of his book because I think they're powerful. Denton details science's relentless progress towards an unexpected conclusion. That conclusion is that the universe was intentionally designed for human beings. From the laws of physics to chemistry to biology, from the properties of water to the characteristics of fire, he shows that the goal of the cosmos is human life. And this person who reviewed the book 
the scientific and theological consequences of this study are immense. When I read that review of that book, I thought I must get that book, and I'm glad I did. It's fascinating. For somebody who says he doesn't know about God, is to take so many aspects of the natural universe and show clearly that it's pointing to one thing, and one thing eventually, and that thing is mankind. That thing is us, life on earth, and not just any life on earth, but mankind. I find astounding. It's an unexpected conclusion. Many scientists wouldn't like to admit it. A design for human beings. <coughs> the goal of the cosmos is human life. Michael Benton has no doubt about that. Let me finish, or nearly finish, by actually showing you the last page of his book. We don't need to read it all, but let me just pick up one or two points. This is him summing up what his book is telling us. All the evidence available supports the core proposition of traditional natural theology that the cosmos, specially designed whole, with life and mankind as its fundamental goal and purpose. Specially designed whole, with life and mankind as its fundamental goal and purpose. In his second sentence he says, For centuries the scientific revolution apparently destroyed man's special place in the universe. But the relentless stream of discovery has turned dramatically in favour of teleology and design. As I hope the evidence presented in this book has shown, science, which for centuries was the great ally of atheism and scepticism, has become at last, in these final days of the second millennium, what Newton and many of his early advocates so fervently wished to show, the defenders of anthropocentric faith. Mankind, science, become at last the centre of science. And the pointer to, or as he puts, the defender of faith with mankind at its core and at its benefit. So, I was trying to get you to think with me tonight about how on earth are we here. Not so much why are we here, we'll think about that another night, but how on earth did we get here on earth? Statistically, impossible. But science is pointing to the fact that it was designed, it was intended, it was there in the heart and mind of the designer. So what do we do next? How did we get here on earth? Well, the Bible does not give you a good clue. I hope you read the Bible. I hope you take time to read that first chapter of it. I told you about it tells us how we, living creatures, and many others, arrived here on earth, the only planet that could support life, for the reasons I've tried to bring before you. But from the how question, there arises the why question. Why are we here on earth? Well, let's look at just one or two statements that might point the way. One of the reasons is that God planned it that way. God made the earth for our benefit, so that we can actually live here and find Him. I've given you a, quote, a reference there to a book in the New Testament called Acts, and in chapter 17, a very famous preacher called Paul is preaching in a city called Athens. And in his sermon, he talks about creation. And he talks about how mankind on earth is there for a special purpose. And he says something like this. God is not far from any one of us. In him we live and move and have our being. If perhaps we may seek him and find him. One of the great reasons why we are here on earth is God has put us in a place where we will look for him. And if we look for him, we will find him. The Bible says, God himself says, those that seek me will find me. The Bible says, I will be found of you if you seek for me with all your heart. 
That's one of the reasons why you appear on earth. But there's another reason. To this very same earth, one day, just over 2,000 years ago, something happened that had never happened before or since. The Son of God left heaven and came to live here. He came down to this earth. He was born as a baby in Bethlehem, as you all know. But he came into this world not to live, although he did live. The purpose of his coming was to die, and to die to redeem us and save us from ourselves and from our sins. Even these days with the advance of science, people can't help but admit it, that things are going wrong in the world, that we as a mankind race have not been very good at looking after planet Earth. It's been plundered and spoiled, deforested, overfished, resources used for no good purpose. And God sent his son into the world to save us from ourselves and the mess we've made. But not necessarily the mess we've made of the world, more intimately, the mess we've made of our lives. This thing that the Bible calls our sins, or sin fundamentally, is disobedience to God, is leaving God out of it, is going your own way. And if you go your own way in this life, you can't expect to find God in the next. But Jesus Christ, the Son of God, came down here, to this earth, this privileged earth. He came down here, and the real purpose was to redeem us, to save us from our sins. And the other wonderful thing, and with this I leave you to think about it, here on earth, Jesus said that he is able to forgive our sins, able to save us from our sins and their consequences. But only if we put our trust in him. He's done all the work that's necessary. He satisfied God's justice and holiness. He's shown God's love and mercy. And he wants to save everyone. But he won't save anyone against their will. He wants people to trust him. You know, it's a wonderful thing to be trusted, isn't it? Oh, most of us are friends and we know they trust us. Many of us are parents, and it's great when your offspring trusts you, whether it's children, grandchildren, or great-grandchildren. It's a great thing to be trusted. But it's a horrible thing not to be trusted. For somebody to say to you, I can't trust you, I don't want you. And yet many people tonight are saying to Jesus Christ, I can't trust you, I don't want you. And all that the Lord Jesus can do is say, all right, have it your way. But that is how we are on earth. And that is why we are on earth. And as well as thanking you for listening to me tonight to this first lecture of the week, I do trust that especially these last bits will make it all think. One song that I have a few to get and I want to give God thanks for it as we normally do as Christians, but one announcement before I finish. If you have this week's programme, you'll notice that tomorrow, Tuesday, the Title was Why So Different, and then Wednesday was Why So Amazing. I thought about this and I want to change these around. So tomorrow night will be the amazing bit, Wednesday night will be the different bit, and then Thursday will be as announced. Why is it all so significant? I don't think that will upset you, will it? I'm sure you'll take it as it comes. Let's pray and give God thanks. Our Father, we do give thanks for your goodness to us for another day for watching over us, for keeping us safe, for bringing us here, for putting us here in this world where we can seek and find thee, where we can find the Lord Jesus Christ as a personal saviour and friend. We ask that everyone here may have this assurance. We give thanks to you for this cup of tea we're going to share. We ask that you'll be with us as we do our different ways tonight and hear those prayers that we now offer with our evening worship and thanksgiving. In the precious name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen.